Expanding Your Horizons Meet a Scientist series. This is where we get to sit down and talk with a real scientist and ask the questions you've submitted either online at our website or at our webinar last year. My name is Jenna Tadero, and I would like to introduce our special guest, Dr. Lauren Genova. Lauren graduated from the University of Delaware with honors and a bachelor's degree in chemistry. She also earned her PhD at Cornell University in chemical biology. She's also now an assistant professor at her alma mater, University of Delaware in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Uh, so Lauren, I know you prepared some slides, which I'm sure everyone's excited to see if they're watching on YouTube. If not, sorry. <laughs> would you like to tell us a little about yourself? I would. And before I share my slides, I just want to thank you all for having me. It's such a like a dream come true to be back here. So I helped out with expanding your horizons when I was a grad student at Cornell. So it's like so surreal to be like still involved with it, but from the other side. So really excited to be here. So thank you to Jenna and everyone else who invited me to be here and to all of you tuning in today. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to hear us chat. So hopefully um, you will enjoy these slides that <laughs> I have prepared. I think Jenna had asked me the first thing was about introducing myself. So I'll start by telling you all where I I grew up. So I grew up in a small town. It's called Reading, Pennsylvania. Whenever I tell people outside of Pennsylvania where I grew up, everyone's like, where's that? So I have a couple of helpful geographical tips to help orient you here. So if any of you have been to Philadelphia before, I'm about an hour-ish drive away, depending on, you know, plus or minus 20 minutes, depending on how much you want to follow the speed limit there. <laughs> but <laughs> beyond that, my town of Reading itself is actually pretty well known. If you've ever played Monopoly, the game before, one of the little squares on the game board here, if you blow that up right there, this is a Reading Railroad. So there's actually a square called the Reading Railroad on the Monopoly game board. And that's my town, not Reading from the Reading Railroad is my town. It's really interesting backstory we used to have a railroad that went through our town but it's no longer in operation so it's like a defunct railroad but still you know that's what our town is like one of the things our town is best known for so we are very proud we are very proud of that space on the monopoly game board all about us um, also, if there's any Taylor Swift fans in the audience, uh, Taylor Swift was actually born and raised about 15 minutes away from my house. So she was in a suburb called Wyomissing, uh, which is still in the grander district of Reading, Pennsylvania, before she moves to launch her career. I think she went to Nashville, Tennessee after that. So yeah, she grew up and like spent, I think she was about 14 years old. So maybe the same age as some of you all who are tuning in today um, that she then like moved out of Pennsylvania. But that's another thing that our town is like known for. Like people will just go around like <laughs> telling them, oh, did you, and telling other people like, oh, did you know Taylor Swift grew up <laughs> like 15 minutes away from my house? Yeah, that's a, that's a big thing. One of our favorite things to, to talk about. So that's all about my hometown. And so as I was growing up, I got involved in a lot of stuff. My parents introduced me to t-ball. You, have you heard of t-ball and Jenna? It's like, yeah, I didn't play t-ball, but I played softball. <laughs> I well, skipped that step. <laughs> <laughs> so t-ball is like the first stage that you go before you transition to softball. T-ball is where like the, the baseball or the softball is actually on like a tee, like a, like a, mm -hmm. I guess I was terrible at that, but I tried. I think that's the most important thing. I think that's like a good lesson in all of life. Just keep on trying and like, don't, you know, be afraid to try again anyway. So we, we tried that for quite a while, but sports was not my thing, uh, but music was, I was really into playing the flute and the piano. So this is my, my piano and my flute. So I had a lot of fun with that. I started learning piano when I was about around six years old and then flute when I was nine or 10. And I loved them both. I played in different orchestras and bands. I had so much fun with music. 
But also, as I was growing up, I also really loved science. And so I enjoyed thoroughly all of my science classes, all from elementary school all the way up through high school. But I think one of my favorite science classes of all was when I was a junior in high school, I had chemistry for the very first time. And I got to work with one of the most incredible teachers who has literally left such an indelible impression on my heart. And honestly, I think influenced my whole entire career trajectory. So big shout out to Mr. Bauer from Exeter Township Senior High School. That's this guy right here. So he made science so much fun. We blew things up all the time, (laughs) as is quite the case for chemistry. There's usually always fire involved in some capacity. So the very first day of class, he had some gummy bears that he put in a test tube with some other chemicals and he set it on fire. So that that like set the tone for the rest of the semester. (laughs) Usually every week, at least something was like being exploded. But one of my favorite memories of all was every Halloween, he would orchestrate this giant chemistry magic show. So we called it Chem Magic for short. And so what happened is we would invite all of the elementary school aged kids to come to our high school for a safe Halloween night. But it was, is it was always held a couple days before Halloween and it gave the students the opportunity to, instead of like just knocking like door to door on Halloween in case there were some unsafe neighborhoods, this was like a very safe environment. So all the kids could come to the school with uh, their parents or an older sibling or their caregiver, any, any um, adult. And they could safely go from door to door of our high school. This is like after hours. All the teachers were all in. So they would go all out decorating their doors. The high schoolers would also help like decorate doors. And then the teachers would hand candy out to the students as they, the elementary school aged uh, children as they would go um, from door to door. But the biggest, the grand finale was everyone would congregate in our cafeteria and we would put on this elaborate chemistry magic show. So for all the kids, it seemed like it was a magic show because we were making things explode and changing colors (laughs) and doing all sorts of things. We would also have everyone go outside at the very end and our chemistry teacher would explode a pumpkin with thermite. And that was a like, don't try this at home kids (laughs) at the moment because it can be quite explosive both figuratively and literally but we had so much fun it was amazing to see these kids faces light up as they you know we would perform these elaborate tricks I mean they were just simple chemical principles that we were taking advantage of but to the kids it literally looked like magic and I just fell in love with that I thought that was such a cool outreach opportunity to get students excited about science like all of you who are tuning in today like it's so amazing that you're here and that you're excited about science, but the unfortunate reality is not everyone is. And so I think it's really important to show the world just how fun science can be and not something intimidating, but something very accessible, something that we can all do. So was that the moment you got excited about STEM? You know, I think it was definitely one of them. I think definitely exploding that pumpkin. I got to help. I was recruited to help explode the pumpkin with a thermite (laughs) that year. And I think that was definitely a turning point. I always really loved science, but I think it was around that time that I really got involved and got to see just how excited the the students' faces were when they like saw this chemistry happening in action that I decided that I did want to go into chemistry when I got to college. Another interesting thing that was also, I think, a turning point in me wanting to pursue science was I was involved in a lot of clubs. One of them was Science Olympiad, which I highly encourage all of you to check out if you haven't already. They have a junior high division as well as a high school division. So a lot of you are probably already eligible. But the one thing, it's it's basically like the Olympics, but all of the different sports categories are science related. And you already know my history of (laughs) being an athlete didn't quite work out. So this was like my like second taste of (laughs) trying to get the gold. They literally do have like a gold medal, like first place is like you literally get a gold medal. So I felt pretty like happy up there on on the stage. But one of the, one of my favorite events they have, you know, like just like you have different sports, right? In the Olympics, we had different events. So we had a fossils and rocks and minerals Mm -hmm. identification. Loved both of those. Um, The other one that I really liked, and I forget the name of it now, it had a really catchy name, but it was 
it was essentially what you had to do is you had to design a musical instrument out of just everyday objects and use the principles of sound and physics to be able to demonstrate like your ability to transform this everyday object into an instrument and play a song. I think it might've been called The Sound of Music. We'll roll with that title for now. <laughs> Sounds pretty apt, right? And so I literally got to make a flute out of a PVC pipe. It was such a cool experience. And it also, like, I think that was the first uh, time that I thought of science, actually, that I was a actually able to channel my other passions and, like, my creativity side and my art side into science. Before, I always thought of music and science or the arts and science as just two separate entities, like two just completely opposite disciplines. But actually, like the more I became immersed into science, I found how integral art and creativity and recognizing patterns actually is to succeeding as a scientist. So the two disciplines, arts and sciences, are actually very interwoven. I'm sure Jenna is are also familiar with that. It's really cool to see, right? Yeah, yeah. I am not personally so I love art. I'm just not an artist, <laughs> but it's something I really appreciate. I wish I was a better artist, but yeah, you you still use those skills and it's you something really that I, I struggle with, but I still use them every day. <laughs> right. And just like creativity in general, like thinking of creative solutions to scientific problems. We're all taking everything that you're learning in school right now will help you in one way or another, I firmly believe in the future. And so that was another like, uh, um, kind of like thought of affirmation and so wanting to pursue the sciences that oh I get to still use my artistic side and that I'm still able to blend my love of like the arts into what I do every day. Do you have any advice for our listeners or viewers who are really really artistic and like they're the opposite of me they they're really artistic and they struggle with the science but they really want to pursue science per se do you have any advice for them? Oh, absolutely. Go for it. You know, sometimes all it takes is to just explore and find what aspect of science really resonates with you. Yeah, maybe you haven't really found your true calling for science yet, but honestly, in you know, in middle school, what you might be exposed to is what biology, maybe some elementary um, chemistry or physics, as well as uh, maybe the life sciences or geology. But there are so many different incredible subfields of science. Science can become a lot more specific as you move up. So if you're not a huge fan of biology, but maybe you really like animals, but you didn't like learning about like everything else in biology, you can focus on just like zoology. Uh, when you get to, to college. If you really like bacteria, that's a whole other field of microbiology. If you like studying really small things, again, microbiology. There's so many different types of science that you really don't have a chance to explore until you get to college. So first of all, don't lose hope for that. I think having an open mind is something that's really, really important. But also there's no one right path to become a scientist. There's nothing that dictates, like you need to get an A plus in this course to become a scientist. You know, it doesn't matter. It definitely doesn't matter. Grades, as you'll find out all throughout, uh, I, Jenna probably shares my feelings about grades. Sometimes they are a useful metric, but very often they are not. Actually, for Jenna and I, when we got into grad school, we had to take like an achievement test to get in, and it's called the GRE. And recently, research found that the GRE, your score or your performance, your grade on this standardized assessment, has absolutely no correlation to how well you will perform in grad school. What that means is that even if you got a perfect score on your GRE exam, that doesn't mean that you're going to be a blossoming scientist. Um, it, it has absolutely no correlation. And by the same logic, if you didn't do a score as well as you did on that test, you could be an incredible scientist. So I think it's really all up to, you know, just having an open mind, keep going, forging your own path to everyone's path path is unique and there's nothing that says you can't do what you're doing and also creativity is invaluable as a scientist because we're designing our own experiments coming up with new ideas all the time so even in media or whatever they're always hyping on like 
they're not, cre we're not creative, you know, it's always the same stereotype. That's not the case. Creativity is so important. And back to the GREs, a lot of schools are getting rid of standardized testing because it has been acknowledged as a, a faulty metric at best. <laughs> so we'll see where things go with that. But it, it, I am hopeful that grades are not the only metric going in anymore or not the the standard metric at least. Right. And not even just for grad school, but just like even honestly, like in your school right now, like there is more to, uh, you should not be defined by grades. Grades don't define who you are as a person and you should not let that deter you from following your passions. You can do anything you want. I think if you have the desire to go for it and you have the drive and the determination to, um, you know, explore new things and don't be afraid if things don't, you know, everyone is going to make mistakes in the beginning. So not being afraid of failure and, and just pushing through and overcoming your obstacles is going and having that resilience, I think is really, really going to be fundamental and for you to be able to be successful at whatever you want to pursue. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And I wish that I knew that now that's always like hindsight's always 2020. 20, right. So when I was still in high school, I was like, Oh, I'm making the right decision by going into science. And I, I now can firmly look back and say, yes, I did. And I'm so excited to be where I am today. And so hopefully I can share, hopefully some of my story, at least a little tidbit here and there can maybe resonate with some of you. That is the ultimate goal. I think of this whole series that uh, Jen and her team is putting on for you. 